Okay, I will start with a picture of um, people in a kind of uh, party-like setting. And uh, so why do I put this picture here? Well, it illustrates one of the, well, the basic question that I'm trying to investigate, namely, how do, did language emerge in communications of agents? So we talk all the time, we are social beings. Our language changes also as we use it. We are very creative. Uh, we, we discover new ways of saying things. We use language as a tool, really. So how did this emerge? How did this did language come about? And how um, yeah, does it continue to evolve? So these are the two basic questions that I'm trying to investigate. And then if we, if we make this more practical and we, we translate these questions into the, an, an AI in artificial intelligence context, um, well, what we are trying to do really is, well, we, we, we pursue this question of the build, well, how can we build truly, truly intelligent systems that are able to perceive the environment that they, they are embedded in, can reason about this environment, about actions they observe, about uh, or things that they see, and re so reason about it, and then also communicate about what they've seen, or even about things that they have seen yesterday, or <laughs> of course I don't have yet the day see, but in the past, or or things that might happen in the future, how they can communicate about all these these uh, things around them, and the communication in most of what we do serves a certain purpose, and this can be a task of of uh, that you ask an agent to bring you something. So to, to execute an action for you, uh, it can be about uh, answering questions, but usually we, well, always, in fact, we, we, we strive to develop methodologies that are not sensitive to a single task. So that, that are able to handle multiple tasks. So you can switch and that, it, and that the model itself adapts, uh, adapts itself, sorry, to the new context, to the new task that it is given. Okay, so we do this under the umbrella term of if we... Somebody says something. Ah, Brigitte said, yes. Hi, hi Catherine, sorry. Hi. Yes. What were, what were you saying? She moved ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, you know, if there is a question, you can always ask me. So evolutionary and hybrid AI. And you will see also when you look at my, my research team, we are actually the evolutionary and hybrid AI team. And I will I will explain you what, what we mean by that. So evolutionary AI for us denotes you know, systems that emerge and evolve under evolutionary principles. And I will explain you in more detail what, what, it, what I mean by that. And then the hybrid part um, for us, because this is a term that is used a lot nowadays in AI, in our interpretation, hybrid means systems that combine logic-based methods and uh, statistical or numerical um, methods or techniques. So we, and for us, so, so you can say that we try all the time to build this bridge between sim the symbolic, symbolic reasoning so that we get symbols that we can reason with, but then for the low level perception, for, for, for uh, audio, for, for different, well, perceptive, really low level capacities, we, we exploit or we use a numerical techniques, neural techniques nowadays, uh, and we always try to build bridge. So this is really the, uh, the for us, the hybrid, hybrid nature of the systems that we build. Um, so why do we do this? to gain a deep and precise understanding of what the computational mechanisms are that underlie the emergence and the uh, processing of, of human-like languages and also the learning of human-like uh, languages or communication systems more in general. And there are two important principles in this. There is the evolutionary part, uh, of course, that, that will also then um, cater for, for or, or, or make, make sure, sure the robustness uh, of the systems that evolve. And then there is, um, and this is also part of this robustness actually, there is also the idea of self-organization that is really um, 
at the core of, 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 of the models that we built and that we learn. So let me explain what I mean by that before I go to more concrete uh, use cases. So for, for when it comes to evolution, um, we take the Darwinian definition of evolution. So for just a very fresh uh, high school uh, <laughs> refresher. So there is the first the concept of her hereditary replication. So there's replication. You, you have, uh, of course, we, we speak here about, uh, about linguistic systems, and, but I will, I will come back to this. So in that case, a, a new word that comes up, a new pronunciation of a given word. So you replicate, actually, every time that you speak, you replicate in this, in this sense um, the, the, the units of language. There is a variation because you have a different way while well, you pronounce it differently. There is a maybe there is noise. There are all kinds of of, of, of effects that 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 um, bring about a variation in, in in language, which of course also in species. That's where where Darwin of course uh, was talking about in the first place. And then we select uh, the fittest uh, units, uh, the fittest genes in Darwin's um, case. That 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 um, we select these to then replicate again, and so on. So I'm, I'm sure you you remember how how this works. So examples of evolutionary system, of course, there is the Darwinian evolution of species. Um, that is, is the most famous example. But then there are ma many evolutionary systems that were known and that are studied. Like the immune system is still evolving a lot uh, today. Well, it has been evolving uh, all the, for a long time. It's still um, known as an evolutionary system. The brain also, the development of the brain is known. But also I think cultural uh, artifacts like jokes. If you tell a joke, every time it's not, it's not exactly going to be exactly the same, right? You, you don't remember com by heart every line of the joke. So you, you tell it, it's a bit different, but then you notice certain parts, if I say it like that, or I add this, maybe people laugh louder. So the next time you will reinforce that part of the joke. So there's also this evolutionary dynamics um, in things like jokes. But then even um, Charles Darwin himself already talked about language um, as, evolution, as an evolutionary system. And I will just briefly read uh, this quote from his book. The formation of different languages and of distinct species and the proofs that both have been developed through a gradual process are curiously the same. We see variability in every tongue and new words are continually cropping up. But as there is a limit to the powers of the memory, single words like whole languages gradually become extinct. As Max Müller has well remarked, a struggle for life is constantly going on among the words and grammatical forms in each language. The better, the shorter, the easier forms are constantly gaining the upper hand and they owe their success to their own inherent virtue. To these, more important causes of the survival of certain words, mere novelty may, I think, be added. For there is in the mind of man a strong law for slight changes in all things. The survival or preservation of certain favorite words in the struggle for existence is natural selection. So you see, even already that long ago, uh, Darwin, when he thought about evolution of species, he had already this cultural dimension also in mind. Um, and of course, if you study um, language evolution, as, 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 as we do, there are different, uh, yeah, language evolves on a number of different axes. So there is increased brain complexity that, that over time well, that's, I mean, I will be brief about it because I could speak just about this in the initial uh, part of my talk for, for two hours. But the brain, of course, has evolved over time, has become bigger and, and more capacities have emerged. Then also the way in which we live together as social beings, ecological organization has changed. So there is uh, increased complexity there. And then the language itself, as also well evolves all the time, and of course, if um, 
you want a build, to build a complete theory of language evolution, you should take into account all these three aspects. So you, you should study social evolution, biological evolution, and then the cultural evolution of the linguistic system itself. Now, in our work, we focus exclusively on the cultural evolution part. And there are many other people actually that we are also, well, we're connected to, I would say, working on different parts of this puzzle. But it is possible to get already a very clear picture of how the mechanisms in, in cultural evolution of languages um, are at play and, and what their role is. So cultural language evolution, our main hypothesis, language is the evolutionary system as it is. There is variation, creativity, problem solving capacities of, of language users that, that, that bring about variation. Because maybe you can't think of a word, so you describe it, or, or if you, 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 you change, um, you, you forgot to add a case, so you, you use different word, or, or you, you do these kind of, 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 of smart things um, that cause variation in the language. There is selection, uh, success in communication, whether uh, you, this, this did the job, so, you, so the other person actually understood what you meant. Um, and then, of course, there are physical constraints, uh, cognitive constraints uh, of what we can imagine and what we can express, physical, what you can pronounce, um, etc. Okay, so then there is, the, so that was for evolution. And, and this will all come back then in the experiments that I will show. And there is also self-organization that is crucial, actually, in, 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 in everything uh, that we do. And here, so you see a a flock of birds, you might have seen this in real, it's actually quite um, impressive if you see it. And each individual bird is, yeah, is, 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 is flying in a certain uh, way and uh, according to, to certain rules, but not really rules that somebody told the bird. If this is um, you know, all, all uh, individual behavior and and, 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 and it's not innate, a bird will learn this, this, uh, to fly like that. But, okay, so you see, there are individual birds, how to see them. But there's also the flock, right? And this, ma at a macro, macro level, we can, we can draw the analogy, the analogy sorry, between the flock and the birds uh, case here. And more examples, of course, in nature. And, and language as a whole. So you have the language that we speak, and then there are all these individual language users that, that, that talk, that, that are coordinating, that align themselves to each other to, in order to understand, in fact, what the other is saying in order to then evolve in, in communication. So this, this idea of self-organization is a second crucial concept, and it also um, it's related to, to the biological uh, observation of emergent functionality, like here, this is a, a termite nest, and there are um, like, um, how would you say it in English, like air uh, pipes or so for ventilation, so that it doesn't become too hot. It's not that there was one architect uh, aunt that said, oh, okay, let's build there the ventilation. Or this emerged, uh, and then the functionality of, of, of ventilating their, their nest um, came, came with it. Of course, you can make this joke. That's that is it resembles like there has been, as if there had been a real architect behind um, this kind of, uh, of 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 construct. So then we go go to the experiments that we do, and um, in that respect, so the, we follow the language game paradigm. This is a, a well known uh, methodology that uh, was established in the 90s in the field of AI. And the main hypothesis is that um, we ask, so how indeed a population of autonomous agents, like autonomous birds, but then uh, artificial agents, um, with, usually we use robots, but it can also be in simulation, how they can construct, bootstrap a language through the principles of evolution and, and self-organization. And the methodology that we use for doing that 
is agent-based modeling. So in every different language speaker is, is, is an autonomous agent in our system. And they, they, what does this mean? That there is a population with a number of individuals, but there's no single, there's no boss or there, nobody can, can dictate the others uh, what they should do. There is also no mind reading. They can't look into each other's heads. Um, they can only observe what the others do. Of course, they can speak uh, and, and, and do actions, but they can't, can't actually um, yeah, look at, this is the most important thing. I think. They can't do broadcasting for the whole group. They, there's not a dictator and they can't look into each other's heads. So there are autonomous agents in the true sense of the word. And then, so I already mentioned this, but we often use robots for actually embodying these agents. So there is a population behind it, but then usually because of, uh, it uh, depends on which robots, but if they are quite expensive, we use two bodies and then we download the agents to pairwise into these bodies and then they play language games. And so this is the language game paradigm. And what does this mean that they play language games? So in a language game, there will always be a goal. So, um, and they, they know, they know this. So this is, is actually given in a game, in a script of the game, that there is a goal and the goal can be a reference to things. So if I, I talk, I want you to, to point to the things that I mentioned, or it can be action. If I tell you something, I want you to do that action. Or it can be question answering. If I ask you a question, if you're supposed to answer, okay. Um, so, so that's that's the goal. It's a basic script of the game, actually. And there, there are a number of, of different types like that. You can you can imagine. And then there are two agents, and one will play the role of the speaker, and the other one is the hearer. Uh, important to mention is that, and maybe it seems trivial because we are humans, but both agents can, or, or with a single agent, can take on both roles. So you, they can either be selected to be the speaker in one game, or in the next game, then they can become the hearer. But this is not the case in all of today's experiments in other groups. So that's why I mentioned it so explicitly, because sometimes there's confusion. But they can be speakers or hearers. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So one is a speaker. Um, I think here it was the, the guy or, or, or girl, I don't know, or the thing, the robots in the back. Um, and this is a, an example, I think of, uh, it was a reference game. So he, or it, it's, it's very difficult to talk about all of Yeah, the robot in the back said a word or something. Well, uh, there's no notion really of words, but, but said something, okay, blah, 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 blah. blah. Or woo ba doo, okay. Then the other agent thinks, aha, woo ba doo. What, what could he have meant? And then, okay, if he doesn't know, he gives up. And then the other one, guy will point, the robot will point to, to the, the topic we call this actually of the game, in, in, in a game like that, the topic. And then the, the hearer will try to infer, okay, woo ba doo refers to this thing. Does it refer to, uh, to the, the object as a whole? Is it like a proper name? Does it refer, is it about its color or a certain property or, or where it's put? There are multiple hypotheses, right? About what it's written. So he stores a hypothesis. And then the next time, so he will take part in another game, maybe he hears Wabadu or he, or, or I don't remember what I said, or Wubada. And then he uses it, but he might find out that ah, it was not about the color. Maybe it was about the location because I used Wabadu, but the other didn't understand me, or or I heard it again, but in a different use. You see, so every time that he hears the same word or a different word for the same thing, and so etc., he will update uh, the inventory of, of of his language. So, and what is behind these experiments, like the one, the picture that you just saw there, is this, um, this cycle of processes that we implement uh, computationally. And for all of these, we have also software. So if somebody is interested, it, it can run on, on any operating system. So the semiotic cycle has three main levels. There is the sensory motor level for dealing with the world. 
around us. So um, then there is the conceptual level. This is about uh, building conceptualization. So if I want to talk about that backpack there, about coming up with the structure uh, of how to actually reach that backpack, because there might be other backpacks, so I have to maybe screen the backpacks, filter, maybe I do some spatial operations. So the conceptual structure to that then will be expressed in the linguistic level in a certain way. Maybe I say um, the backpack on, on the three chairs you know, in the left of the room from my perspective or, some, or four chairs or something like that. So these, uh, these levels are there. And the first one, so going from the world to the, uh, the actual conceptual structure, this is what we call the grounding. So you really, you, 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 you have anchors to things in your world. Um, you get maybe uh, already features from this. It depends, of course, what which kind of game you want to do, but often you get features. Sometimes you already get labels. It depends how we do it. Uh, and then there's a conceptual structure and, and then the linguistic structure here. So the production of an utterance and the comprehension of an utterance. So this here on the right, by the way, is the hearer. So the hearer is, is actually going through the same cycle, but to revert like, the second part of it. So he doesn't start from the world to build up a conceptual structure and then express it, but he received, well, he also starts from the world, yes. He, he makes uh, also a, a world model actually from, from what he observes, but then he will observe an utterance, try to understand what is being meant, then couple what he understood to what he sees around him. And so that this is the, the comprehension and interpretation part of the cycle. So we implement both as, as, uh, yeah, as, as a holistic uh, whole, and both agents can actually do uh, take part in, in any, well, any part of this, of this cycle. But you will see uh, better how this works. So the most famous game, and this is the textbook example, is the naming game. I will go a, a bit faster over this, uh, but this is the how it all started. So it's about proper names. So inventing, inventing names for, for things or for like proper names like Steffi, right? Or, or Katrin. So you can, or Vienna, you can, you can point to it and it's a unique, it's a unique name. Uh, so everybody knows what you're, who or what you're talking about. So in, we have again our population of agents. We draw two agents from it. In this case, agent five will be the speaker and agent eight will be the listener. Then agent five, so the speaker will think about a topic, but he doesn't yet disclose it to the, to the listener. So he wants to talk about this, this, this yellow figure here. And he says, Bolima. Okay. Now the listener actually points to the yellow figure. So this game would be a success. And this is already when they have already built up a certain associations be between things and, and, and words. So you see in the naming game, the variation becomes uh, from the fact, comes from the fact that each agent can invent at random when he doesn't yet have um, a name, he will invent. And each agent can learn or adopt a name from another agent. So you hear multiple things. Maybe you have already a name associated with that thing, but then you hear another one. So you will also store it. And then the selection that takes, that takes part, um, make sure that agents will retain names that lead to community higher success. So we will, we will, we will uh, reward successful games and, and, and punish uh, words that were used in in failed games. So if we do uh, this, we get curves like that. Uh, you have here the time, the number of games that, that have been played in, in the population on the X axis. And on the Y axis, here you see the communicative success, which is this green, greenish blue line. So going up really fast. And then the lexical is the, the yellow brownish that goes here for a population of, 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 of 10 agents, talking about 10 objects in the world, um, goes to about 33 names. So you might think that's, that's a lot. Why are there not 10 names for 10 objects, right? Well, this is of course, because everybody is just inventing as, and, and they speak only locally. So they do many local interactions but um, 
yeah, they, 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 they haven't really converged in this, in this example here, right? So for object one, the, 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 the yellow figure that we saw already, there an agent can or, or, or uh, an agent can have uh, words like Bulima and Sifala, and object two might also have two names associated to it. So how will we how will we make sure that this system becomes more uh, harmonious or, or becomes more um, yeah uniform and that, that everybody will use the same name? Uh, we use um, alignment uh, techniques. And in that way, we try to, to mimic the idea of self-organization. So how do we do that? We assign scores to the associations. So object one, Bolima, object two, oh, uh, sorry, Bolima gets 0 0.5 and Usifala gets also 0 0.5. And then if you hear it in a successful interaction, you will actually up, uh, increase the score of this association and you punish all the competitors. The other words that's, that's that, that are associated with this object in your, in your personal vocabulary, in your personal association table. Or also, if you are the hearer, um, I don't know, sorry, this was for the hearer, sorry. And then you get a, a, a curve that looks more like this. So the, the success still moves up and your, your lexicon really goes neatly, well, nicely to 10. Of course, if new agents come into the population, or if your world, well, if more objects are there, this will okay again go up and then and then go down, or well, or maybe if the world changes all the time, it stays a bit higher. But you see um, the dynamics. Uh, ah, yeah, and this lexical coherence. This is just a measure. It's not that important to see if everybody would say the same to name the same thing. So you see that the success is actually at 100% much faster because they have, they, they, they wouldn't perhaps maybe say all the, they wouldn't all have the same preferences to name certain things, but they would understand each other because I know, ah, Steffi uses that word to name the, this, this object here, but I have another word for it, but we understand each other. So that's the red thing. Okay, this part, I think I will skip in the interest um, of time because I want to go to, to, to more recent experiments. This was just a textbook example. And, and, and the example that I've shown you was a symbolic naming game where the objects actually had just labels, object one, object two, object three. But then if you go, and these people have done it, of course, but if you then go to the real world, yeah, you have all kinds of different problems of, um, first of all, identifying objects. Okay? Uh, but then if they, if, if I, if I come in and I, and I, and I see, I don't know, I see Steffi from another angle, maybe I don't recognize her because I have stored her <laughs> like that. So, so you have to, you have all these different, uh, more diff difficult problems. So that's the grounded naming game. And, and Luke Steels, uh, and Martin Lutsch and Michael Spranger, they have worked, um, a lot on that and they have, uh, some, some very good papers if, if you want to know more. Um, about that, this, these kind of games. So here you see they, yeah, they would have not only. I will just explain the dif the difficult the challenge involved there. In the in the in the symbolic game, you only had this part actually of the screen. So we had objects or individuals they're called here, and then words and association scores. So scores uh, uh, um, that indicated the preference of the agent for a certain uh, association. But now we have the sensory experiences, and this is then some kind of representation. You see, here are all the channels that this agent can use um, to, to, to represent an object. So you have all the objects in, the, in a certain scenario, in a certain setting. And then you have your prototypical views that you store, so you have to do some distance. And then here you might have multiple views for one individual, because we have seen it from different parts, etc. So they, they did all these kinds of experiments. But in the end, they succeeded, but well, very successful. It was actually very successful. So they could show that the same dynamics uh, works also in the real world. And, and by the way, this, this idea of, of, of what we call it, I haven't used the term, but uh, the, the, the idea of lateral inhibition. So this alignment of punishing the scores of competitors and increasing scores of, of, of successfully used combinations, there are proofs for this that it will then your games will converge if you do if you do it 
within certain limits you know, of update uh, increase and, and decrease values. Um, this, is, this is a safe strategy to, to, that leads to convergence. So these are were the results, of, but I will not speak about it. Then this is more recent work that I did with my, my students in, in Brussels then about, not about learning names, but about learning um, concepts like, well, that, that's actually for, for attributes of things. So uh, things like, like color would emerge or, 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 or well, or, or spatial relationships, um, or also size uh, and different, so different uh, ways of, of, so qualities actually of objects. So we did a number of experiments on that. And um, the ground concept learning game is, is the one that, that, that I will present to you in a bit more detail. So what we did here is we, we uh, took a data set it was available uh, for the community. So from, from visual uh, question answering, actually, maybe people might know this data set. It's very, well, quite famous, well, I think relatively famous. It was uh, released already in 2017 as a diagnostic data set for testing whether um, visual question answering systems wouldn't take uh, shortcuts. So if in answering questions, that you have to truly, re really reason, actually, to be able to answer it. You couldn't just um, exploit biases like uh, if you would ask what is uh, what is the color of the grass that that would say green or, or I don't know that that just by the, using the language and statistical inferencing you could answer questions without actually looking into the image. So they, they created a data set um, of which which uh, contains geometrical objects that that are, that's, uh, or can be rendered with Blender and uh, there is no correlation whatsoever into where things are located, how many large or small uh, objects there are. So it's, 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 it's um, randomly distributed and, and yeah, that's, that makes it a, a good a test bed. Also there are, but we, this experiment we didn't use it, but later I will, I will show you something. There, there are also questions that come with this. Um, like, uh, what is the color of the sphere in front? I just invent something, but these kind of questions. So you would have to answer the yellow, and, and there are answers. There are also uh, procedural annotations to the questions, like which operations to do. Um, like you have to, um, for example, filter, query, color, these kinds of things, they are already available in the data. So just to know, to give you an idea. But for this first experiment, we, we went, uh, <laughs> we, we used good old fashioned uh, feature extraction um, uh, tech tools that are, that, 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 um, that are available. Because here, what we wanted to learn are actually concepts that are, um, that are transparent, that, that you can look into so if you, if you would, for example, learn the, what purple would mean, then, then you could look into the concept, ah, purple means maybe, I don't know, the mean H value is at so much, the mean S, at, so you, you would see in this sea of features here, there is a certain spot where purple belongs. But then, of course, if you would see other examples, maybe more, more uh, different types of of purple or your language becomes more fine-grained that you can say ah, violet or I don't know if it's the or, or fuchsia or you would have different subtypes that then your, your, your concepts would, would change and your values would adapt. So you could see really what is going on inside your concepts and that they remain adapted. So we started from something like this. A scene would be annotated with a number of, of, of features and then they all get, get a certain value just the observation right and then we make a hypothesis so the first time that we see a cube or this is a tutor by the way this is, was a tutor learner again there was one agent that already knew the english concept all the words uh, for in english and the other agents didn't uh, didn't know this they didn't have anything actually except for this feature extraction uh, that we did so he heard cube and then he will just store 
all the, 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 the channels, the feature channels um, that, um, yeah, here, uh, this is actually a different color space I see now, but it doesn't matter. It will just store actually the exact representation as it was observed the first time with uh, weights of, of, of zero, this is a uh, kind of certainty score, zero, and then for each of the channels, like y cos, it would store also a region uh, in, in which uh, this, this was observed. And then what happens, so then, yeah, this is now for blue, but imagine you see that another instance uh, of, 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 of Q, or, or in this case of blue, and you have already stored blue, you will then you will look at ah, which other objects are in the same scene and how, so I heard now blue, how can I discriminate actually uh, which, which features matters here to, to, to know that it was actually about that object. So you would increase, in this case we, we increase this to the certainty that R, G and B were channels because there were probably no other uh, blue objects, so, so they were too far, the other objects were too far on, on these channels. And then the other things that 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 were more confused that, that actually brought noise to the to the to the to the image were punished. So you in this case, so in this way, you will always every time you increase, you decrease the things that are not discriminative, and and over many many games you get a, a kind of system with with concepts that are interpretable in the sense that for Q, for example. After processing the whole data set, you would, uh, well, not the whole data set, because it's actually one million, or this learns much faster. Uh, a certain portion of the data set when it stabilizes. You see, um, Cube would have uh, for the channel number of corners eight and number of sides six, so this is very sure about it. And it still has something about area. It thinks, ah, maybe area is important for Cube. Okay, and for large. It's, it has a very high score for area, with a certain value attached to it. Because also the value, I didn't say, but it's every time the value of the channel is also updated, because this is like the prototypical value on that area channel, which, which go, goes from zero to very big. <laughs> so it would also shift every time and to observe a new thing a bit on this, on this, on this axis or for X position. Also, but here it's, it's, it's still things that large has to do something with the exposition, but not a lot. Probably it will get filtered out after when you run more uh, of these. So once you have then these concepts, we then also use them actually in, in games um, where we use the same clever data set for, for training agents to learn to, uh, to answer to questions. So once they had these concepts, uh, so basic, basic concepts about color, shape, material, size, they would then be able to use them um, yeah, in, 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 yeah, in the answering of questions, but they didn't yet know the grammar. So you have to learn them now the grammar. So if you hear a question, how many blue pubes are there in the, in the image? And then you get the answer for, Philip <laughs> just invented here, then our agents, uh, will have to assemble a kind of program, a semantic program, to compute something that ends at four. So this is how we did it. So you would get a, you get an inventory of, 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 of primitive operations, which are actually the building, I will show it actually in a minute, the building blocks of your semantic programs. And these are the operations that are also, in fact, part of the data set, but it doesn't matter so much. Filtering, querying, um, counting, these kind of basic operations that you can then chain together to build a program that you can well, execute on the image to retrieve an answer so you can verify whether it is actually the answer that you expect. But we will see uh, in a minute, but I have to stop actually already very soon. So I will go really uh, quickly over this. So this is just for those who want to know more about the software side. So this is all part of the Babel toolkit where we have systems for the robot interface, the sensory motor processing, and then also the conceptual semantic programs engine, IRL, and um, fluid construction grammar for, for, for the grammatical, the, the, the linguistic processing engine effects. And there is a paper if you want to know more about FCG, 
So the grammar part, um, there was a recent paper where we explained the motivation uh, underlying FCG very in, in a detailed way. And there's also a software uh, program uh, with a single click install that you can, you can just, well, try out actually how, how FCG works um, with our new FCG editor. But then this, this, I already mentioned these semantic programs and, and this, this idea of grammar um, that, that would then um, actually, if you, if you would answer a question that you would execute a program, you might have wondered, what does this mean? Um, I never thought about the meaning of a question in that sense, but let me just show you an example here. So if you would ask a question like, are there any bears or dogs? Again, this was in, a, in an experiment that we did with images. So you would first run this question through an, so this, this fluid construction grammar analysis and, and what does this do? Well, construction grammar, very, very shortly. Um, constructions are, are, are in, in, in the theory of construction grammar, the basic units of language. So all linguistic knowledge is stored in constructions. And they, they are used in, in comprehension and production of language. And they, they combine in, in utterances or in discourse also. Uh, to, 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 and they, they, they actively actually construct an analysis of, of an utterance that you hear. So here, are there any bears or dogs? You get there an analysis. There is some dogs construction and nominal. And each of these constructions have a form and a meaning to it. So, so the dogs, for example, would yeah, would have the form dogs or just just the speech wave for dogs associated to it, and then uh, it probably has something like white dog. So get the concept of dog, evoke dog to to this. Then there are nominals that would maybe have filter entity. So every individual construction has some. Yeah, this can be a predicate representation like here, so a kind of um, explicit meaning to it. And then you have also there the, the last construction. Are there any X or Y constructions? So this X or Y, these are two slots. And then the dogs and the bears can fill this slot. Uh, and, and, and it's through this last construction. And then this whole, actually these separate predicates are, are glued together through the arguments of these, of these different blobs, actually, that, that are analysis uh, um, had there or, or, or suggested. So here the meaning now, if you want, of this question in our system is, so you get the context, this is just you segment the scene, you filter entities in this context that, uh, that are close to the dog concept, that, that remind you of dogs. Um, and here you have on the, on the bottom you have again, if you are also filtering on the image and you, you combine all the bears that you find, then you check, uh, you run an exist on these two sets. So you have your, your, all your dogs. You said, is there something in this? Actually, are there dogs? This is me, right? Is there an, an, an instance in your, is your set uh, more than, than, than zero? Um, you do the same, exists for the bears, and then you have a logical operator here for or, so or, x, y, and you bind the result of your or, so the boolean is true or false, to this final variable that will then also constitute the answer actually to your, to your question. So very briefly, and then I, I have to stop, you, um, your question, will be executed. This is procedural semantic representation. You execute actually this program that your language processing uh, yields. And the answer to your program, well, to this execution, basically is then your answer. And now, and, and I know I, I have to stop it. Well, this is, we are, we are as I already mentioned, we are, uh, this is uh, at the moment happening in, in, in Namur and in Brussels. We are building uh, algorithms and constructing uh, systems to to learn uh, bottom up actually the meaning. So this is, you can think about this as these programs, as the semantic programs. Um, so we are learning these constructions because in the past we have we have been writing large grammars by hand, and and but now we use our our language game methodology that we have used already for many times for concepts and for for other things as well to also bootstrap the grammar part and and. 
And there we, we learn, um, we are learning patterns like dog on sticks just by observe, by, by generalizing basically over observations and previously seen patterns. So we are, we are, we are building generalizations like that. If you have already heard dog wants ball, which you stored as a whole, a holistic construction, then you hear dog wants food. Of course, not just the string, but importantly also the, the, the semantic program that goes with this. You can find patterns and distill the slots out of these patterns, both on the meaning side and the form side, where you have the X and there the question mark. And then you can learn, I, I, will, I will go over it, but you can learn the grammar for these data sets. This was for Clever again, because we use it really as a, as a, yeah, really a benchmark to get this up and running. Um, and then you can see at the end, when you have done this, all kind, this is one part of, the, of this kind of constructional network that, it's, that emerges. That you can learn things like how big is the X, Y, and then the X slot, all these colors were observed in, in that slot. And then you can see like all the material stuff are observed in sorts of other constructions. So you, this is like a bottom-up bootstrapping of this grammar for, for question answering for that data set. And at the moment we are running these, well, testing actually the same uh, generalization algorithms on, on different data sets, uh, but I can't go into that now. So I think I will stop here. I will just go over this to my final slide. So briefly, this is the project that I'm currently most, uh, most involved in. If you want to know more about this, also this, this learning of, of the grammars that we do on, on grounded data sets. And this is all in the context also of, of the MUHAI project. And, and then there's our, our group, the Belgian Evolutionary and Hybrid AI Foundations, where you can find all about the, our demos or, or papers of our work. So that's, uh, that's it. I think I, I have to stop here. So I'm happy to take uh, any questions if you, if you have some.